is partly what uh, has caused such a backlash because I think people, particularly community members, communities of color, don't like to view themselves as being lab rats in this larger smart cities experiment that we're witnessing across the United States. The smart street lights themselves are actually a piece of physical hardware, and they have a number of components. They can detect light, they can detect atmospheric data, but crucially, they also include a video component. So they're actually collecting footage. So the original intention was that no video footage would be collected, but just the computer connected to the camera would see a car going by, and it would make a note, one car went through my field of view. One bite went through my field of view. It's gonna be an environmental good. It's gonna be a public planning good. And they brought all this to the city council in late 2016, but what nobody talked about, but what officials knew at the time is that the devices had surveillance capabilities. And so you fast forward about two years later, the police department is investigating a homicide that took place in the gas lamp district. And they realized that actually there's a camera up in the street light. And that camera might have captured this crime. So the police department goes to the city officials and they said, we want access to those devices. And the city officials downtown said, sure, we'll give it to you. And so no one else in the public had any idea that there were law enforcement capabilities of this project, not only from the beginning, but over the couple of years that they wound up rolling out more than 3,000 different cameras attached to these sensors across the city. And that's essentially what happened with the police department getting involved. The city of San Diego, if we're collecting information that can be used to solve a crime, there's a legal requirement to turn that over to law enforcement, like any other business. If somebody were shot in your front lawn and the police came by and said, hey, you know, we noticed that you had a security camera up here, you have to turn over that footage to law enforcement and the city of San Diego is no different. Media outlets start reporting on the existence of the street lights and how they're actually being used. And so there's a big public backlash to it in 2019. So by the summer of that same year, there's a protest down at City Hall that community organizers had hosted, demanding that the city council and the mayor's office create better rules around the access to these devices because they weren't happy that the police department was the one that wrote those rules. We didn't think about it. And so there was no conversation with the public, no conversation with our policymakers. The outrage, and and I, I feel the outrage that this was this community meeting is the first time that they get to talk about the technology so the trust coalition is a coalition of more than 30 community groups lily irani is an associate professor of communications at uc san diego we looked at a bunch of cities um the two cities we looked at the most closely were oakland and seattle brian hofer was a paralegal who in 2014 decided to take a lead on oakland's citywide surveillance program he has since become the go-to guy on surveillance regulations and has worked with 30 cities and police departments around the country. Constituents are everybody. Uh, everyone at the municipal level is a stakeholder. You know, the police, the electeds, the community, everybody uh, should have a voice. And that's what this model does. It doesn't exclude the police from having, you know, an input into how they're gonna use their own equipment. It just includes the public for the very first time. Most policy writing, when it's even existed, has been done unilaterally. I, I gave them the Oakland uh, ordinances and they you know, modified it a bit to, to make it appropriate for San Diego. And uh, just also kind of refine the language, you know, lessons learned over the past few years from the Bay Area versions. City Council voted unanimously in support of both the privacy board and the surveillance ordinance. San Diego City Council unanimously approved two ordinances this week aimed at protecting people's privacy from surveillance technology, including smart street lights that were once being used around the city. They would have to go through a checklist of things that they considered before they bought it. And they also proposed the creation of a privacy advisory board, which would be made up of regular people, but who were also experts in, say, cybersecurity, encryption, civil rights. Uh, it would also include community members so that the conversation around how to roll out technologies as part of the Smart Cities Initiative would be more collaborative. Adding to the political conflagration, the City Council discovered the technology this didn't... This meeting is being it recorded. It turned out that the data wasn't as pure as we wanted it to be. There was a lot of, of problems with the data as it relates to accuracy. 
you know, there was an expectation of, of having accuracy in the, the high 80s to low 90% in terms of counts. And in some cases, we were seeing 50 to 60%. So by the summer of 2020, when the city council decided to effectively defund the Smart Street Lights program, even though San Diego has said they personally won't go into those cameras and pull the footage, other agencies could potentially get in there and pull it. And they could send a subpoena they could physically uninstall and get the device themselves. And it's always possible they could go into a courtroom or they could go to the company and say, unlock what's on here for us. So even though the program here in San Diego is temporarily shut down, other agencies, potentially ICE, potentially say local police departments, they could still have access to these devices. We just don't know. With the smart streetlights, the police got in front of the community and said, we only use this for the worst crimes. We're only using it to find murderers and rapists. And of course, nobody likes murderers and rapists, but the police department did use it to look at who was protesting in the streets last summer. You know, they did use it for somebody who vandalized the building. And so they were not actually using the surveillance technology in the way that they themselves stated. Protesting is a First Amendment right. That's freedom of speech. And people aren't going to exercise it. And our democracy loses something if they're afraid that those 4,000 cameras are going to film them and come back to fight them one day because they participated. I think a lot of cities fall into this kind of fear of missing out. They look at other cities, see that they're deploying technology, and they want to do that too. And their policymakers are pushing in in that direction. We want to be smart. We want to be innovative. We want to be cutting edge. Well, don't fall into the trap that technology is going to solve all your problems. One of the hallmarks of the smart city view that I identify is Ben Green is the author of the book, The Smart Enough City. This perception of the world through technology goggles. When you're viewing the world through this lens, you're seeing every social problem as fundamentally a technology problem, viewing technology not as an end in itself, but as something that is a secondary force that may or may not be able to help us accomplish those goals. The data collection that government is engaged in, regardless of what city or jurisdiction, is probably decades behind what is being collected from your smartphone today. One of the things that we learned as after we started deploying the intelligent streetlights is that there was other ways for us to get more accurate data. Private companies provide data that you can purchase that's infinitely more accurate. You look at Amazon Ring, you know, they're going and getting the police departments to basically be their marketing agents. There's no real oversight or transparency. You know, neighbors can be spying on each other. People could be stalking, a, you know, ex-lover. And we don't really have any insight or, or control over that because it's all private parties. I think there is no complete understanding of the technologies that exist today, especially regarding uh, cybersecurity regarding uh, questions around privacy. Was, was ahead of its time, and it was what was considered the largest Internet of Things rollout at the time, but I don't think by any means it's going to be the last. I think San Diego was a place for experimentation and a place where officials could make mistakes for the benefit of other cities in the United States, but what you're certainly going to see is that there were lessons learned here that other cities can hopefully incorporate and internalize. The era of smart cities is already here. But it's important that their constituents know what they're no, getting. No, no, no. There's always the risk of too much of a good thing, as San Diego's experience shows. Perhaps we only need the smart enough city, and always for everyone to be informed of what's happening. You going? All right, I'm gonna ask everyone to please mute yourselves as we continue the program. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. We hope that you found that video informative. And if you have any questions, be sure to hold on to them for our question and answer portion. My name is Anaya Brown, and I'm MOGO's Director of Policy, Advocacy, and Community Empowerment. Welcome to the final town hall in our 2022 town hall summer series. We started with our ranked choice voting town hall in May, continued with our protect town hall in June, 
And now we're concluding with our town hall on the surveillance oversight ordinance this evening. For those of you who have attended any of our previous town halls, welcome back. And if this is your first one, welcome. Tonight, I have the extreme honor of introducing our incredible panelists for the evening. We have Khaled Alexander, founder and president of Pillars of the Community, and Seth Hall, coalition member of the Trust SD Coalition. Leading our panelists' discussion is Mogo's very own executive director and co-founder, my boss, Genevieve Jones-Wright. With that, I know we're all very excited to get this discussion started, so I'll turn it over to you, Jen. Thank you so much, Ms. Brown. And I will say that I am not her boss, y'all. We do not have bosses at MoGo. <laughs> well, we have bosses at MoGo. We're all bosses, but we do not have bosses at MoGo. So I would like to make sure that I spotlight for everyone my esteemed fellow panelists, Professor Khaled Alexander and Seth Hall so that everyone can see their lovely faces. And you know, this is interactive. So we want you all to know that this is a conversation and we will have a question and answer period. Please feel free to use the chat and just enjoy. Now we saw the video. We think it's a great introduction to the conversation tonight, but I do, in the spirit of interaction and active participation, want to launch a poll that I would love for you all to participate in. So here we are. First question is, when did you first hear about smart streetlights in San Diego? Was it before 2019? Was it 2019 or 2020? Was it last year in 2021? Was it this year? And if it was this year, was it within the last month or so? So if it wasn't within the last month or so, but it was in 2022, pick this year. And then same options, but a different question for number two, when did you first hear about a surveillance oversight ordinance in San Diego. So again, your options are before 2019, 2019 and 2020, last year and 2021, this year. And even if it was this year, but more accurately, your answer would be within the last month or so, please pick that option. At this point, we have 41% of us participating. We're at 45%. There is also a third question do you think surveillance technology affects you or your community? Yes, no, and I am not sure are your options for this question. I wanna thank you all for participating. Keep answering those questions. We are at 70% participation rate. That is awesome. And this helps us understand our audience and it also helps us to understand how effective our town hall is or was. So if you can please answer these questions, that would be wonderful. We have a little over a minute and a half uh, remaining for this poll to remain open. Unless we can get to 100% before then, we are at 75% participation level. So again, third question is, do you think surveillance technology affects you or your community? Yes, no, I am not sure. And when did you first hear about smart streetlights in San Diego? You will see that smart streetlights is in quotes. I do not think that they're smart, <laughs> but that's what we call them. So those are in quotes for that reason. You'll hear more about why I believe that, hopefully during our conversation tonight. And when did you first hear about a surveillance oversight ordinance in San Diego? So I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll, I think that we have 100% participation. So thank you so very much. And we see the results of the poll, 28% of us heard about smart streetlights for the first time in San Diego before 2019, 33% of us in 2019 and 2020, 
22% of us last year, 11% of us this year, and then 6% of us the last month or so. As it relates to first hearing about the surveillance oversight ordinance in San Diego, we have 17% of us hearing about surveillance oversight ordinance before 2019. And for 2020 and 2019, 39%. Last year, 11 of us heard of it first. For the first time, 28% of us this year, and then 6% of us within the last month or so. And then finally, 89% of us believe that surveillance technology affects us or our community. And none of us believe that it doesn't. And 11 of us are not sure. So those are the results. So you can take a screenshot and look over these numbers, but these are the results of the poll at this point in our town hall. Thank you all so very much for participating in that poll. Well, the first question I will then ask our panelists is, did anything surprise you with those polls? Seth, I'm looking at you. Yeah, I look, I think that it's really encouraging to me that 80 some odd percent of people understand that surveillance technology has intersection with their life. Um, and that is no shade to the 10 or so percent of people who don't, haven't quite put it together yet because it's really complicated. Um, and it, it sometimes is really difficult to understand why it connects with your community and with your life. So uh, that's, that's, a, that's really encouraging to me to see those kinds of really high numbers of people who, who see relevance of this issue to their life. Professor Alexander, anything to add to that? He said it as well as, as, as I could. I mean, I'm glad that we have that amount of people here. I think that has to do with the audience that would show up. Um, and hopefully that 89% will, you know, continue to get other people to be aware as well and get, you know, 89% of San Diegans to be more interested in and understand how surveillance technology is directly impacting them. Indeed. So from the video, we saw that the Smart Street Lights started in San Diego at in 2016. And I'm going to see if I can mute folks. Let's see who's, who's not muted, who should not be. <laughs> okay, so we, we saw and we heard that the Smart Street Lights program in San Diego started in 2016. And what we were told, and actually I'm going to say city council, right? I want to just get to the heart of this. We really didn't know anything about this as just community members in 2016. We had city council being told by city leaders that we have this wonderful program that was innovative and that we needed to invest significantly in upgrading our city streetlights that were embedded with the technology that would help us with our lighting infrastructure that would help us with our energy consumption by bringing our energy consumption down and that these streetlights would collect data that would be used to build and create jobs for San Diegans. It would help us with our parking. It would help us make smart decisions, right? And these smart streetlights were housed in the city sustainability department. And we found out as community members that city council themselves were not given the full picture. And then we later learned that our police agencies said, we didn't even know the full capabilities of these streetlights. And so the Trust SD Coalition was formed in 2019, 2019. Khaled, you were there from the start in the room were, organizations and community members came together and said, I'm sorry, we have to do something about this. Can you talk about how Trust SD began 
And why was it important for us to form a coalition? Yeah, um, I think it's actually, it's a good kind of insight into the way that um, both civic engagement and uh, governance uh, should work and also how it should never work. Um, I first heard about them because a friend of mine, uh, Dustin, who was then the executive director of Care San Diego, um, told me, hey, are you paying attention to these smart streetlights? Apparently, a lot of them are going up in Southeast San Diego. Um, at the time, I had heard about them, but kind of figured, you know what, people who are, are, are smarter than me, more resourced than me, and more kind of in tune with some of these kind of uh, machinations of, of, of government would, would be on top of it. So I had hadn't really paid attention. After he brought it up to me, I decided to ask one of our council members who had been newly elected, what they, not the council member, somebody from their office, what they knew about it. The answer was not much, but there's a series of community forums that were happening um, where we can go to find out because they wanted to get feedback from the community on how these were, were, were going to be installed. So I figured I would show up to one of them, kind of sneak in the back, take notes, and if it happened to kind of uh, align with any of the things that pillars of the community was working on, particularly the way that law enforcement targets and documents black and brown youth um, and adults under kind of unjust gang laws, then you know we would consider kind of what the next steps were. Uh, turns out I showed up to the the so-called you know community forum, which was at the library uh, by San Diego State University. And I was the only person there. Um, as I walked in, I was greeted. Well, I take that back. The other, the, the people who were presenting were people too. Um, Captain Jeff Jordan from the San Diego Police Department, um, a tech person from GE, &E, and uh, kind of a city bureaucrat were all there. And they looked just as surprised to see me as I was to see that I was the only person there, which to me means there was relatively no kind of outreach going on. We sat, I sat through the presentation and learned that the kind of idea that there was a forum to get feedback wasn't necessarily um, what was happening because in fact, a few thousand of them, these smart street lights had already been installed. Uh, not only were they, did they have audio kind of recording capabilities, but we're also tracking kind of the metadata of everyday San Diegans. Uh, I'm immediately concerned about that, uh, but didn't really, wasn't really sure if I understood the technology, reached out to somebody from Tech Workers Coalition and was like, yo, this stuff sounds kind of scary. Uh, and the response was, yes, this stuff is very scary. And, you know, kind of the rest was just a question of calling people and explaining, hey, you know what, this is happening and I think we should be, uh, we should be concerned about it. Thank you for that, Khalid. I think it's really important for us to draw that through line from governance to civic engagement. Because I think one thing that is super important from the story about Trust SD and how it was formed and the journey to getting two ordinances passed that a coalition wrote, a coalition of 30 plus community organizations is that this is monumental. What we're talking about here today is truly transformative change that was only brought about by community members. And the reason why I say that is because we learned as community members that when we were told the city owns the data that's being collected, our data, that that was not true. We learned that no one wanted to take responsibility for the significant investment that our city council members were told to approve. And it was an investment of $30 million plus because of all of the frailties and, and failures of this so-called smart streetlight technology. We had a city attorney who did not want to fess up to the fact that she actually signed this $30 million contract and actually had a personal stake in the company that owned the data, GE at the time. And this was all uncovered by community members. So with that backdrop, I wanna ask this to the panelists. 
We also learned that the people who were using this technology, the smart streetlights technology, San Diego Police Department, they wrote their own rules. They wrote the rules to the game with what they needed to comply with, how they needed to comply. Why is that problematic? Seth, you want to go first or you want me to take a stab at it? Well, I think you should take a stab at it because I mean, I'm really going to put I, my answer to that would really be that the police department felt pressure to have rules. <laughs> and that's why they wrote rules. Um, but it's more important, uh, Khalid, your, your perspective on what was really going on there, I think would be even more illuminating. Yeah, I mean, the rhetoric was interesting because in the rules that they went, that they that Jeff Jordan, that's his name, right, Seth, Jeff Jordan, that he wrote, um, he would constantly be like quoting from, you know, people that we would consider allies in kind of the efforts that we were making. So he would quote from the ACLU, said, I'm working with the ACLU, I'm working with EFF, I'm working with, all. made it sound like he was one of the biggest proponents kind of for oversight than anybody else. But, you know, the, that's essentially it's the equivalent of allowing the fox, you know, to have oversight of the hen house. Um, if 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 the police, who in a time, you know, and this is following kind of um, George Floyd protests and other types of things, and people who live in communities like Southeast San Diego, where racial profiling um, and and police harassment is an everyday occurrence, you know that they know very clearly why it's a problem that police would be writing their own oversight. Um, and so I think it's one of those things that um, power will never kind of relinquish power on its own, that it's kind of, it's the duty of all of us to kind of push back um, against all of those things. And so the, the, the last thing that I'll say is that uh, law enforcement will often hold itself up and be like, yeah, absolutely, we're against racial profiling. Absolutely, we're against the abuse of, of, of uh, surveillance technologies. Absolutely this, absolutely that, until outside forces seek to actually install some amount of oversight or some amount of policies to, to control them. And then all of a sudden they fight tooth and nail to prevent them. And so I think the proof is in the pudding. Um, if they were really in favor of these types of things, they would have been supportive of these ordinances from the very beginning. Um, and the fact that they weren't supportive of that, the fact that they weren't trying to have community input or frankly elected officials input in the way that they were overseeing this surveillance um, is the kind of the most damning evidence for me. Why would you want to hide what you're doing to surveil um, the people who you've been sworn to protect? And you certainly hit on why oversight of surveillance technology is important. But I do want to just ask that question specifically because we, we know things like COINTELPRO has taken place in this country where surveillance technology has been used against communities of color. We know that communities of color are adversely affected by being over policed by having surveillance in our communities. But specifically, can you just talk to why is this conversation so important? Having oversight by community members of the surveillance technology that our city wishes to acquire, that our city wishes to deploy, that our city wishes to buy and use. Well, I mean, uh, to, to your point, my great grandfather was a runaway slave. His seeking freedom was illegal. Uh, the way that you keep slaves enslaved is through surveillance. Now, they may not have had technologies like we're talking about today, but there were technologies that were used nonetheless, including kind of freedom papers and other types of things that were used to control them. My grandfather, his son at an early age became a union organizer and eventually a member of the Communist Party because of his beliefs, because of his political beliefs. Again, he himself was considered illegal and as a result was surveilled by the FBI, eventually put on a blacklist where he wasn't able to work. My mother was a part, to your point about the COINTELPRO, was a, a part of the Oakland chapter of the Black Panther Party um, that was not only surveilled, but targeted by, by law enforcement. I became Muslim in 1995 and had to grapple with you know, my, my faith 
being targeted after in a post 9-11 world is something, again, as other, something that was seen as a threat to, to the main system. So if we don't have people um, in communities like ours, if we don't have people, and yes, it is directly geared towards black and brown people, but it's also geared towards anybody who thoughts, actions, um, beliefs, are deemed as illegal or deemed as outside of the norm. Surveillance technology essentially is about identifying problems. And unfortunately, law enforcement consistently uses that to identify human beings as problems. So what happens if you yourself are the problem? Um, and so unless we have conversations like these right now, unless we recognize in a post Roe versus Wade world, what does it mean when your actions, when things that were once considered and should be considered, you know, ab absolutely normal, are all of a sudden turned into something that can make you the target of a, a law enforcement investigation. So I'm not sure if I answered that question, and Seth can probably be, you know, more articulate. But at the end of the day, if we claim to live in a democracy, we cannot claim to live in a democracy and walk around with blindfolds on our eyes. We have to be aware of everything that government is doing. Um, and if there are things that are happening that we believe can be, that we know are being used in an abusive manner, then we have to do everything in our power to, to stop those things. This is one example of that. Yeah. I completely agree with Khaled. And I love the question, by the way, Genevieve, of why, the fundamental question here, why is this important? Why do we spend so much time passing laws and advocating for the community about surveillance technology. You know, a lot of people, I think, might think that there are better ways to spend your time, you know, uh, that, you know other social ills that we could be spending our, our time on. But what I know as somebody who has been working in technology is that all of these harms that you can imagine coming uh, from, let's just say, from police, right? Technology is an amplifier of those harms. Technology is what is used to make inflicting those harms easier, automatic, algorithmic, right? Take the, take the need to chase everybody around manually and put up a microphone in the, in the parts of the city where you want to arrest the most people, right? And the microphone will give you all the reasons that you need to send police running into that neighborhood urgently with their guns drawn to arrest as many people as they, as they suspect. So that's why I love this question is because surveillance technology is being used to, to rev it up, to amp it up to 11, right? Uh, past to the points that we have historically seen and to increase the numbers. And there are, I think that people really need examples of this to help solidify it. And we have just examples coming out of our ears on what's going on out there. You know, just the other day, um, you know, people are, are suing ShotSpotter, the company that, that put the microphones out into the neighborhoods to try to detect gunshots, right? And the people that have been wrongly imprisoned behind ShotSpotter alerts, they're shoot, they are suing ShotSpotter and they're saying, we will not stand for this anymore. And when ShotSpotter is dragged into court, what is this company that if you look at their marketing, their marketing to you, us normal people, individuals in, in, our, in the community, their marketing says, we're here to help you. We're here to help police. We're here to make everybody safer. But when they are dragged into court, what are you actually seeing them do in court? They say, we don't want anything to do with this court process. Rather than be accountable to courts, we would rather be held in contempt than to, to produce the documents that show what we're doing in these neighborhoods, right? So that's one example. The, there's many examples going back to talking about Roe, a post Roe society that we live in. You know, and even in 2019, when we theoretically had Roe, Missouri, the state of Missouri had officials 
watching the only Planned Parenthood in Missouri and creating a spreadsheet of the menstrual cycles of the women who visited that Planned Parenthood so that they could determine for themselves if the laws that they had in that state governing abortion had been violated. This is what we're talking about. You do not have to look to China. <laughs> you, China does a lot of very interesting and terrible things with surveillance technology, but we just don't have to look that far. And it doesn't even have to be in a post row society, although it's only going to get worse, right? So those are the reasons, those are the kinds of reasons, and we have other examples that we could talk about those kinds of reasons help crystallize for people that these technologies, while they are pitched, they're supposed to be helping you and making you safe. In fact, what they are doing is contributing to the algorithmic and automatic harming of society, right? And without any controls on them, they are going to continue to do that in ways that are even hard for us to predict, right? Um, the, the harms that they are going to cause are only going to become clear after people have begun to experience injustice. Thank you for that, because there's a lot of talk about the smart streetlights, but the focus of the Trust SD coalition was never just about smart streetlights. And just to make it very plain for everyone who may not know, but Trust SD stands for transparent and responsible use of surveillance technology, San Diego. And I'm so glad that you brought up shot spotters. And for those of you who don't know what shot spotters is, it is a gunshot detection technology. And the way that they market themselves is a gunshot detection technology that quickly and precisely identifies gunshots. It mathematically triangulates the location where shots have been fired and dispatches officers quickly. And we know from other jurisdictions and even right here in San Diego that shot spotter technology is very much flawed to the point where as Seth talked about, people have been wrongfully arrested and held in custody based on these errors, I'll call them errors, that this technology has provided over to law enforcement agencies. Now, one thing that I want to make sure that we know about in San Diego is that we have shot spotter technology deployed, but it is only deployed in one district in this city, and that is District 4. That is in southeastern San Diego. So let that sink in, right? And as Seth mentioned, there are a couple lawsuits in Chicago going on regarding this over-reliance of po these police agencies on this technology that rarely leads to evidence of gun crimes, but they're also using this flawed technology to wrongfully convict people. And as Seth also mentioned, they're hiding their hands in court, even to the point where they're saying, you know what, judge, just hold me in contempt because we don't want to actually give you over any records. So I remember sitting with you, Professor Alexander, and Lily Irani with the San Diego Union Tribune editorial board having a conversation around ShotSpotter not too long ago because ShotSpotter, of course, wanted to continue to deploy their technology and get more money from us taxpayers for this flawed technology and SDPD was very much interested in renewing the contract. And we had conversations around why that was a bad idea. We ultimately persuaded the San Diego Union Tribune editorial board that they should not endorse a renewal of the shot spider contract. And so I'm gonna count that and also the fact that we stopped the renewal of the contract with the city of the shot spotters that's a victory that people probably don't know about, but that came as a result of the work of the Trust SD Coalition. Uh, do you all want to add anything to that? Yeah, I, I think it's important. Again, I live in, so I live in District 4. I live within the four-mile radius that ShotSpotter has put up, and it's important to understand what is ShotSpotter. ShotSpotter does not detect gunfire, as you were saying, Genevieve. It, it, it detects loud noises. 
what do those loud noises then do? They, had, they then have the police come storming into our neighborhood, which is already over policed, ready for and with excuses to take violence action on anybody that they see in that area. So that in itself is alone, is, 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 is important to kind of understand and be aware of. The other issue is, of course, that ShotSpotter is a company. It's a corporation that has goods to sell. How do they sell that to us? Through fear. So not only do they go around and are continuing, by the way, after council decided they weren't going to renew that contract, they've been going around to community groups and telling them, in fact, saying how happy there are in ordinances in place, because they want to, now this is going to open up the doors for them to be able to not only have ShotSpotter in District 4, but to spread ShotSpotter throughout the rest of San Diego. How do they do that? They hype up this fear, this idea that you're going to be shot at any moment, that, you know, that, that there's, we live in a crime-ridden city, that the irony of all of this is, is all it does is report the sound itself. It doesn't protect anybody. So the best that would happen is that after you've been shot, that the police will, will come. The other thing that this technology does is it makes it so that the police don't have to rely upon human beings for their interactions. So rather than trust the community where these supposed loud noises are coming from to actually call and report that somebody has been shot, now you no longer have to, to, to actually have a community member. You can actually come in and storm these communities um, as if they're filled with enemy combatants um, just because a loud noise was heard. So not only is the technology ridiculous, but the idea that this technology is going to actually prevent crime or make anybody safer is equally ridiculous. The only way to address crime the only way to protect people is by um, by building stronger communities that actually know and interact with one another. Last thing that I'll say, the price tag on this in a four mile radius is something like six hundred thousand dollars a year. Right. So it's not like they're 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 claiming to protect us out of the kindness of their own hearts. Right. There's a profit to be made. Um, and as long as there's a profit to be made, um, they're going to be making making that pitch. The bigger question is this. What are elected officials doing to protect us from unscrupulous companies like ShotSpotter who have dollar signs in their in their eyes and absolutely no concern for the actual individuals that are impacted um, negatively by this community? And Genevieve, before we close up on ShotSpotter, for those of us who might not live in District 4, it might be tempting to think of this as like a like a thing that's happening over there. It's, it's important to understand that the way that police handle these shot spotter events in other cities and here is that they are notified. And when they're notified, they, they're not notified of a jackhammer or a car backfiring or a firecracker. Everything in shot spotter is gunfire. So when the police are re receiving that alert, they stop what they're doing <laughs> and they run to the site to deal with gunfire, right? And, and they go in with the mentality that they need to defend themselves or others from gunfire, right? What that means is that if we see an increment of shot spotter deployments being pushed, what you're going to see is police are going to stop doing the work that they otherwise would be doing, and they're going to go chase these shot spotter events all the time. And for those of you who don't live in District 4, what that's going to mean is less service in the neighborhoods that don't have, uh, that aren't uh, alerting of gunfire. And what it's going to mean inevitably is police saying, you know what, we just don't have enough police because we're running around chasing car backfires and jackhammers and helicopters that cause confusion with these audio sensors, we're sending our police around to, to chase those around. So what we really need is more police, right? We need to increase the police budget and we need to get more police in here and that that will be the answer. So even though that this system is pitched as a way to help streamline police work, the reality is, is that it sends police down rabbit holes doing busy work where there are no gun, there is no gunfire and they and they're not going to be focused on 
responding to your emergency call, right? They're going to be unavailable for that because somewhere in the city, guns are blasting, right? And they must run there immediately. There is no higher priority than the gunfire that they're hearing. So important to make sure that everybody understands it's even if you don't live in District 4, this is coming for your tax dollars and it's coming for the services that you may otherwise expect police to be performing for you. Uh, last thing I'll say is these technologies are like easy, so easy solutions to complex issues, right? So what they, what they sell to us is fear. What they sell to politicians is an easy solution. So now, you know, a politician, luckily we have council member Monica Montgomery Stepp who, who actually cares about the community, is aware of the community and, and, and involved in the community and knows what to support or not support. But you have other council members that are like, oh my gosh, crime is up. What am I gonna tell my constituents? I'm not doing it. Hey, you know what I did? I brought in shot spotter technology. Hey, you know what I did? I put in, we'll get to this later. I put in an amendment in an oversight ordinance to make sure that you know law enforcement can get away with doing whatever they want to do. So again, these are these are uh, cheap solutions that allow politicians to give the impression that they're actually doing something to some real issues that people care about without actually doing any work. Yeah, you know the the truth behind all of this is that we've seen the law enforcement narrative always reinforce the need for a bigger budget and more police. It doesn't matter if their tactics work. It doesn't matter, you know, I really wanna to touch on this study that the MacArthur Justice Center performed around ShotSpotter. And it actually showed that although they claim to be 97% accurate, that in 89% of the cases where this gunshots were detected, there was no gun related crime. And 86% of those dispatches led to no reports of any crime at all. And in certain jurisdictions, Chicago being one, there were, count them, over 40,000 dead end police deployments in 21 months. So talk about diverting police <laughs> attention away from real crime. And here we are sinking money into something that has shown to be dangerous for communities of color, expensive, ineffective, and the list goes on and on and on. But no matter how much we uncover this, law enforcement never changes the narrative. They were still seeking to renew the contract. They still seek more funding, even though we know they're just sinking money into this failed technology. So, you know, we can talk about that all day. Um, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add to that, Seth, or call it. Just uh, law enforcement doesn't benefit from us feeling safe. They benefit from us feeling being being afraid and being fearful, right? And so they buy into these technologies because even if they don't, they can say, look how scared you should be. We have this many responses. Who cares what it's, what, what it's actually happening to? And so anytime you, you mentioned, you know, it doesn't matter what law enforcement does. In fact, the worse they do, according to their statistics, according to their talking points, the worse they do, the more, as a result, supposedly the more dangerous danger we're in. And so we should fund them more, right? You're doing a bad job. So we should give you more money to hire more people to do more of the same so that we can, so that it's, again, it's one of the, I don't know any other kind of service industry or whatever that is rewarded for doing a bad job. You know, I'm thinking about the article that just came out and how bad our police response times are. And I think about how law enforcement gets away with talking out of both sides of their mouths. You know, at one point when they want credit during election season, they're saying that, that we are the safest big city in America. And then when it's also election season and they need to get people in this fear mode, it becomes crime is increasing. And there's absolutely no evidence that crime is increasing is actually evidence showing that that is not true. But as I always say, law enforcement loves their tools and they love their toys. And so one of the, the benefits that I see from the Trust SD coalition is that before Trust SD came along and said, hey, we need to actually get a handle on this. We need transparency. We need oversight. 
The city had no clue as to its own inventory, as to just how much of this technology was being used in our neighborhoods. So a lot of the surveillance technology comes under the ordinance, right? So we can speak about the smart street lights, we can think about shot spotters, we can think about so many technologies that even the city wasn't aware. And that to me is a coalition victory in and of itself. So what can you say about that? Seth? That, that was a question to us. What about our victories? Is that, is that, is that what you're... Um, look, it, I, I have to, we have to admit that because of the lack of transparency that precedes the Trust Coalition, the lack of transparency that has been built into this system, that any information that we can have or, or report to the public is hard fought, you know, but to, to Genevieve's point, the Trust Coalition has, has raised this issue to a level of awareness where suddenly San Diego, which was known as being a hot spot of, of surveillance in our country due to our port and our position next to the border and our strong police community is now really, I mean, it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to overstate this, we don't have smart street lights. We don't have shot spotter. The police, the police chief, the chief of police just got up in front of the city council very recently and, and claimed at least that all of the automatic license plate readers that track every single person coming in and out of the city and track where they go and make sure it's logged and make sure everybody knows where you go, those have been turned off. We're not sure why. We, we can't be 100% sure that that's behind the work that trust is doing, but it's kind of hard to imagine that it's not because there would be no other reason that the police would voluntarily just turn those things off. So uh, when the community has come together into a coalition to perform, to do the work and to, to inform our neighbors and to uh, talk with our elected representatives, it seems like we have been able to make an enormous impact in a, in a relatively short period of time. Absolutely. And so I want to make sure that we don't talk so high level that we forget the foundational stuff that some folks may not be aware of. The Trust Coalition wrote two ordinances, and I would love for you, Seth, to tell us about those two ordinances and what they do in a nutshell. Absolutely. Uh, our city council should be giving their approval anytime a mass surveillance technology is acquired by any city department, by any city department. If we're going to surveil everybody, then that is, a, that is a universal issue for San Diegans, and our elected representatives should have to approve that. Uh, that, didn't, that didn't exist before, and under the surveillance oversight ordinance, uh, that will exist, that the city council will have to, uh, they will have to confront, they will, they will no longer be able to just turn away and say, oh, oh, we didn't know, that's somebody else doing that. Now, the city council is going to have to put their eyes on it, and they're going to have to approve of these technologies being deployed. And the other ordinance is that we don't think that the city council should be alone in that process. It's going to be very complicated and it's going to involve a lot of uh, stakeholders that need to have a seat at that table. So we're going to have a, a citizen-led, a community-led advisory board that's going to take a look at all of these technologies uh, before city council tries to give them approval. And the, the community-led board of experts, community experts and professional experts are going to take a look at each of one of those technologies and they're going to let the city council know whether those technologies pass muster and whether the city departments like the police and other departments are doing their diligent work to make sure that those those technologies are going to be operated in a controlled manner right and that there's some reasonable things being done there's some training there's some 
there's some uh, there's some thought. There is some meetings with the community that they're going to go through. All of those things are going to be a requirement, and that advisory board is going to look at all those things and hand off um, a recommendation to city council. So those are the two most important um, parts of of the ordinances that we've been working on. Thank you for that, Colette. Did you have anything to add to that? Um, no, I did. I mean, I, so, so even just hearing Seth talk about, I mean, so much about the ordinances are common sense that it kind of boggles the mind that it took so long to fight for it. Anytime you have to fight for something, I think we should have to ask ourselves why is it that other that that it that it's so difficult. Um, and that'll probably show you how important it is actually to have it, right? So had we had these ordinances in place um, in 2016, 2016, I think there's very little chance that we would have spent, what was it, $30 million or something like that on a flawed contract giving away um, private information of San Diegans to, you know, whoever the, the biggest uh, buyer is would not have happened. Uh, shot spotter. I don't think those types of technology was, and at the very least, city council would be able to make informed decisions on those issues so that when you have some community member saying, hey, what's the story about that? They actually have an answer, right? Um, so, uh, so much of it is really obvious for me. And so I think had these ordinances been in place, I don't think that we would um, have had to go through this type of fight. It, it's basically good, again, it's good governance. If I was an elected official, I would wanna have as much information as possible in order to make an informed decision. The fact that these decisions we're making without being informed is, is, is hugely problematic. I also think that part of the reason why it's been such a big fight is because I think you alluded to this earlier, Genevieve, or somebody in the, in the video alluded to this, that other cities, corporations and companies are trying to make money of this technology in other cities as well. And so San Diego, in many ways, has become a battleground for these types of oversight. So it's not going to stay in San, San Diego. It's certainly it's going to spread. So on the one hand, we should be happy that this ordinance passed. The only kind of warning that I'll put out there uh, is it doesn't matter kind of what ordinances we have if we don't have elected officials that actually care about um, protecting the communities that uh, are their constituents. Um, so it's absolutely necessary that we speak to any elected officials who's in office now, anybody who's running and ask them, hey, what is what is your opinion on these types of ordina ordinance oversight? Um, and lastly, it's necessary that even though there's a board, that this doesn't just become another board that kind of is created and then nobody pays attention to it. The whole purpose of this board is, yes, to give information to city council, but it's also to make this information public and available to the larger community so that they know what are these technologies happening and make sure that they're, they're pressuring the, 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 the elected officials to make the right decisions with, these, uh, with, 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 with the, new, the, the information that they now have, uh, for the most part, access to. Yeah, I do not want us to miss this because again, it goes back to civic engagement and people power. Yeah. The Trust Coalition had momentous wins. First, <clears throat> at City Hall, when they decided to go forward with our ordinance that would give oversight to all surveillance technology. And I don't want us to take this for granted because we had a city attorney who wrote a competing ordinance that she wanted city council to approve that was very narrowly tailored, that would only focus on smart streetlights. And we knew as community members that that wasn't appropriate, that there was always gonna be some sort of new technology that was gonna crop up, that was gonna be used against us using our neighborhoods, that one, city council should be aware of and that should be vetted. So that's one win. We have a, a, a comprehensive, oversight surveillance ordinance. The other one is with the establishment of the privacy advisory board because we are only the second jurisdiction to have civilian oversight over cities surveillance tech. That's huge. We're only the second jurisdiction that says community members like you and me can have a say in the technology that our city acquires or even can acquire because this privacy advisory board can actually put the kibosh 
on something if they make a recommendation and city council follows through with their recommendation. So I really wanna make sure that we are highlighting that. So with that being said, a lot of folks are asking, they're wondering, how does the coalition view the, the recent unanimous passage of the surveillance oversight ordinance, right? We know that we've had some wins where it's always been a unanimous passage, but we just had a reading. There were some amendments at it. How does Trust SD feel about their ordinance and with that recent unanimous passage? Well, I would love you, for you to flip that one, I mean, with your feelings, because I think it's a great question. How do we feel about it? <laughs> and um, that's complex. So I'd love to, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts. Well, I mean, it, so I mean, it's, it's a mixed, uh, it's, a, it, it's a mixed bag. On the one hand, it's huge, right? That we actually, after fighting for three years, despite the district attorneys opposing it, despite the police department, the chief of police uh, opposing it, despite FBI, despite all of these different large institutions, many council members opposing it, the, the city attorney, Mara Elliott, opposing it, despite all of that, despite the money behind all of the corporations that tend to, that that would benefit from it from the businesses that would somehow be able to benefit from access to all of our information all of these despite all of those pressures despite them trying to sneak it through that we actually pass these ordinances is absolutely huge and we should all be you know patting ourselves on the back and congratulating one another on that i see asian solidarity is out there racial justice coalition is on here right now um, the Del Cerro for BLM is on here. All of those organizations and all of those individuals who are on here as well who did this push, yay, we should definitely, we should absolutely celebrate. I think one of the things that gives me a little bit of, of after we're done celebrating, that should give us all pause is that we have to get away from this idea of there's just kind of one battle to be won and then we can all kind of go home and not worry about it. There's just one person who can be elected and they're gonna take care of things. There's just one policy that should be passed and everything's gonna go away. We really have to create kind of a, a culture and a community that is constantly aware that, you know, democracy is more than just voting once a year um, or every four years. Uh, and it's about actually being involved and having community involvement in all of these things and holding elected officials accountable when they're not doing what, what we would expect for them to do. Again, really happy that this happened. It happening on its own needs to be more than just kind of a symbolic move and another kind of uh, board in the bureaucracy that actually does nothing. And that, you know, frankly, is going to be up to all of us who are involved in it um, and the rest of San Diegans who hopefully we continue to kind of spread information and background about this to make sure that, hey, we have a tool now. This is a tool, that's all it is. And it's a huge win that we were able to get this tool. Now it's really up to us um, and our elected officials, but primarily us to use the tools that we've made available um, to keep us all a little bit safer. Completely agree with Khaled. You know, Genevieve, just to Maybe I'm maybe I'm just too a little bit too boostery, but look look you pull up the list of the top ten most populous cities in the United States of America, and you narrow that list down to the one city that doesn't have automatic license plate readers running, that doesn't have shot spotter renewed, that doesn't have smart street light cameras running, and San Diegans should be extremely proud of the work that we have done here, because I think we pretty much stand alone among our peers at this point. We are going via this work, I believe this city is going in the opposite direction from other cities. Um, and it's not without a fight and the work is not done, um, but we are having incredible success. And these two ordinances, I think are gonna catch a lot of attention from bigger cities that want to look at this and say, maybe we could do it that way, right? And we have to keep working at it and we have to keep committing to it for that to happen. But I believe we are setting uh, a leadership example in this country 
Um, and it's this community that's here today and that we've worked with through these throughout these ordinance processes that have made that happen. It's it's I, I understand we had some battles at the end and there are some things we need to go fix, but that does not you know that that does not make that does not defeat the the joy that I have coming out of these ordinances and the pride that I have in our city for for having accomplished these things. So that being said, after last week's vote at council, what is next as to both of those ordinances? I'll take a stab at that if you don't mind, Philip. Um, the the next thing that's going to happen is that on Tuesday, our ordinance is back on the agenda at city council. Fortunately for us, it's on a it's on the part of the agenda where they have put it as kind of a formality, and we're hopeful that um, that it won't even really show up. That it'll just um, what they call they they will all unanimously consent to it being finished. Um, if that's true, then really the next thing that's going to happen with these ordinances is we are anticipating uh, the community uh, led advisory board is going to need uh, appointments. Uh, the mayor gets to do that. Um, and uh, that that's really the next big, um, I think, bellwether of, of whether this is being taken seriously at the city, right? Uh, if the if the if the privacy advisory board is populated with a bunch of um, people from a certain perspective, right? Rather than a bunch of folks from a lot of different perspectives and uh, from a lot of different backgrounds, then I think we're in trouble um, because the Privacy Advisory Board is really the community's touch point here. Um, and if it doesn't represent the community, we're in trouble. So that is the next uh, big uh, place to watch. It's for um, the Privacy Advisory Board. It's not the only place to watch, um, but for me, that's a big one. Khalid, what are, what are you watching for? Uh, once the maybe once we've cleared the privacy advisory board and we know a little bit more, what do you think um, the next step is maybe for the surveillance ordinance? Well, I mean, right now there's a, a, a pretty glaring loophole in it with where thanks to council member Raul Campillo, it's seconded by Jen Campbell and then voted on with five of uh, city council members that essentially said they don't want to know about this, the technologies that are being used by uh, federal joint task forces. Um, uh, I think that that's really problematic. Uh, Marnie Von Wilpert, Councilwoman Marnie Von Wilpert, um, suggested putting an amendment in there to protect women from um, who are seeking abortions from being impacted by that, which is a, an ironic statement because essentially what that says is, you know, fuck everybody else. Um, and so I think that if somebody is willing to recognize that there's an, a, an area where it should be addressed and amended for some people, that that amendment should be made for all people. Um, you know, that amendment was put in despite all of the evidence and all of like the reality saying that it's actually not even necessary um, based off of these ordinances taking place in other cities. Um, and so I would say that that's certainly one of them. I think the biggest issue that for me, in addition, because everything you said, Seth, I totally agree with. I also think it's absolutely necessary that we begin to have these conversations on why it is that law enforcement can get up, they can lie, they can say whatever, and five council members, despite you know the community involvement, despite hundreds of people calling in, despite um, all of the facts, despite rebuffing everything that the, the chief Nislet had said, still feel totally comfortable pretending like they didn't hear it and voting for these types of amendments. And I think all of that comes down to this idea that law enforcement are somehow superhuman beings. I personally think that police are worse than, 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 than most people, um, but that's not the conversation that needs to happen. They're human. I think we can all agree that law enforcement, that police, FBI, that all of these people are human. And we have to ask ourselves why we as a society feel comfortable giving these human beings a type of power over us that we don't give to our closest loved ones. 
I would never want my mom or my wife surveilling every place that I go in San Diego, listening in on conversations that I'm having, tracking me in all of these. With Those are people who I love and trust. I wouldn't want them. So why in the world would I be, why in the world are we okay? I'm talking to me as, as, as well with law enforcement having the ability to do the same thing. Um, and so if, if it, I think a, a, a general rule of thumb should be if you're not willing to give a technology uh, and a type of control over your life to your mom and to your, your significant other, you probably shouldn't be giving that type of control to a random person with a badge on their chest and a gun on their hip. Spoken like a true professor and community advocate. I love that. So we're gonna go to our question and answer portion. I see some questions. And so this one is directed to you, Seth. Have you or any other journalists actually seen the hardware, the company that is hosting the camera records and vetted the process police or any other entity would take to access the audio video records? Yeah, I think that um, that question was from Jerry. Um, and Jerry, I think you're referring to um, the Ubiquia um, street, street mounted surveillance devices. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I, I have seen a breakdown of those. We had um, close confidence, confidants um, put their hands on those devices, take them apart, right? And, uh, and try to understand them. In addition, here on the steering committee, uh, Professor Lily Alani has worked with some of her students to probe the, the network of those uh, street light mounted uh, surveillance devices to understand their capability. Um, so the, the question is, have we seen the hardware? Have we vetted the, pol the, the police process for accessing them? You know, that's an interesting question because um, the police, the, the access that police have to the surveillance cameras up on the street poles only comes to them as an additional, you can think of it as like when you buy a car, you, you buy the four wheels and the steering wheel, but there's always options, right? There, you get the heated seats, and you get the satellite radio, and, and those are extras that you have to buy on top. Well, those, those surveillance devices that are up on the pole, you had to buy an extra module called the situational awareness module to enable the police to, to have access to them, to basically have a website that they can go to to, to view the footage, right? So, that's pretty pretty nerdy stuff and it leaves the public in a quandary right when we don't know what we don't know about these devices all we can do is cast our eyes up to the heavens and point out that there's a big camera looking down on me you know and we don't know who's behind it are they watching are they recording if they're recording where is that recording going? How long is it kept for? And under what circumstances will it be used against me? We don't know. All we know is that there's a big glass eye looking down on us, and we haven't the foggiest idea what the processes are or the products are that are behind it. Um, but we have had a look at um, what at those surveillance devices that are up on the camera that are up on those on those poles, and. Um, I think that if they ever try to bring those back to life, I think we're going to be shocked to find, well, I'm not gonna be shocked. I think a lot of people will be shocked to find out that, um, that a lot of them are dead and that we're gonna to have to pay again to get them back to life. So if we thought that $30 million was a lot of money, we've only started, we've only started to write checks to support this mass surveillance lifestyle that is being sold to us. Um, because I don't think that those devices have, have fared very well. I think a lot of them are inoperable. And if we bring them, try to bring them back, we're gonna find out that we are gonna have to pay a lot more to make them operable. Well, and 
Seth, the only thing I'll add to that is, again, we have to understand this in a, in, a, in a capitalist system where these corporations, these companies, their job is to make profit. So the idea that they're going to sell us a one-stop solution is ridiculous, right? There's, they, they need to continue making money. And so just like your cell phone, just like uh, your computer, just like your TV, your cable, your Netflix, your Amazon access, all of these types of things, is there's always going to be more, right? And so we really have to be thinking into the future, what type of world do we want to live in? Do we want to live a world that is dependent in every single way upon these types of technologies? Or do we want to have some basic kind of uh, understanding of what life should be moving forward, looking should be for us looking forward. So with that, Professor Alexander, I see you with these wonderful books behind you on the shelf. There's a question about the books you would recommend to the audience. Yeah, so one is uh, Dark Matters by Simone Brown. I definitely recommend this. It kind of gives a history of surveillance and it's, it's kind of uh, impact on, on and the history of how surveillance has been used in this country. Uh, so it's, again, it's Dark Matters by Simone Brown. Um, there is also A Race After Technology by Ruha Benjamin. Um, another really important read. Um, and then I'm glad that you asked. I just happened to have a, a couple of things written down someplace. Oh, there's a couple of Netflix documentaries that and, and tech people who understand this shit might like dismiss some of this stuff as, oh, that's foo foo -y, but they were kind of insightful for me. The Social Dilemma um was a, a documentary that kind of helped me care about this issue um and uh also the great hack i think was an important documentary that helped me understand because i think a lot of the time we don't think through the we believe whatever we're being told this technology will be used for and don't think about the ways that it may be used for in the future and i think a, a kind of a safe rule of thumb is if a technology has the capacity to do something eventually it's going to be done. Um, and so we need to kind of think outside of those things. Somebody important to watch, I think it's LA, Stop LAPD Spying, Seth. Uh -huh. okay. They have a number, they're on the on the internet. They're, they're on the, it so shows how technologically savvy I am. They're on the internet. Um, and so they often have a number of kind of articles and, and resources that they post that I think are important. Seth, any books you'd recommend? Um, I was just reading, uh, a, 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 it's an older book. Um, I was trying to reach back to the history of some of this stuff. And I found a, uh, I'm about three quarters of the way through it and really enjoying it. It's by a, a, um, an author, her name is Anita Allen. And she wrote about, how, about privacy for women um, all the way back in maybe the 1950s or 60s. And, and some of it is just mind-blowingly relevant for today. So if you have an opportunity to look up um, her book, Uneasy Access, um, it's really a, it, it's really even more about than mass surveillance. It's about um, the, the, the privacy needs of marginalized communities, because certainly in the 1950s, um, women were experiencing a lot of, um, uh, they were not experiencing, I should say, a, a lot of opportunities to protect their privacy. And um, uh, I believe she's a professor and still writing. And it's it's kind of uh, one of her original looks at how we protect privacy, uh, especially for, for communities that don't have uh, don't have power. Thank you for that. And Can I add on real quick, it, a lot of our conversation was around city because that's the ordinance and that's like what we're talking about. But we should also be paying attention to these issues when it comes to private technologies that we're using as well. Um, and at our jobs, how is our job? What type of surveillance technologies are our jobs using to surveil us? What type of uh, surveillance is happening right now through our phone, right? And through the clicks. And I think what one of the scary th things that were most scary about the smart street lights is because it really seemed like they were taking what's already happening on social media and website clicks and putting that into our daily life. But those things still exist there. And unless we're aware of how these things are being used against us, again, I think we're in a lot of trouble. Thank you for that. And thank you for putting another 
resource in the chat for us. And I just wanna tell all of the attendees that there is going to be a resource packet that is sent to the attendees. So you will get a list of these books. You will get the text of the ordinances that we talked about as well as some other things. So keep your eye on that. I have another question from a community member. What do we really know about whether these agencies have any measures in place to protect privacy? Sure, we have a, we have a list uh, of hundreds of technologies that um, the city finally inventoried. And it's, it's the safest bet is to, to acknowledge that um, they didn't believe when they implemented those technologies that they needed any kind of policy. Um, so I, I think that um, what we see with, with shot spotter and what we certainly saw with the smart street light cameras was only once you what, only once there is controversy does somebody run back to the office to to, to draft a policy, right? Um, so it, it is really a safer bet to um, to anticipate that the city has not prioritized protecting privacy and protecting the rights of people when they're using when the city's using mass surveillance. Um, and, and, and understand that we may be at the precipice of, of directing the city's attention in that direction for the very first time with this effort. Um, and, and that there is probably not a lot of protection for those things with the existing technologies. Um, and even when you do find something that has been written, um, and you might be puzzled about what it's missing. Right. Um, so, Khalid, what do you think about what, what would you anticipate with, um, at least with the city agencies, what would you think if you lifted up the cover uh, on a lot of these technologies that we're hearing about? Oh, what type of oversight or, or what type of like uh, uh, measures in place to protect privacy? Right? I mean, again, the problem is people are human. So whether there's like technical measures or policies is one thing. The problem is with all of these technologies is there's people behind them and people bring their biases along with them. And so I think we should all assume if the technology exists, regardless of what the policy is, regardless of kind of what measures they've taken to not abuse it, we should all assume that it's gonna be abused at, 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 at some point. Um, and so really what this ordinance is about is getting that information so we're aware of the technologies and then can do our best to uh, prevent those abuses from happening. But I think the assumption should always be that there's nothing protecting us from any of it. All right, well, I have one more question as we near the end of this wonderful town hall. And it is from another community member who wants to know how the surveillance ordinance that just passed connects with the fusion center as it relates to city technology and is SDPD involved? Uh, we should probably real quickly mention what the what a fusion center is because I'm sure not everybody knows what that is. Fusion centers are set up regionally to give law enforcement primarily uh, a central place for different law enforcement agencies to channel the information that they collect so that other law enforcement agencies can then use that information and build on that information to, to do whatever it is that they want to do. So that, for example, the information collected by San Diego Police Department can be visible to the FBI or to the immigration um, uh, uh, authorities that, 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 that are interested in deporting people. So these fusion centers take law enforcement data sources and, and push them into one location so that they can be easily shared among more law enforcement um, agencies. Uh, we certainly have a fusion center here in San Diego it's primarily operated by the county. It's funded by the, um, it's, you know, 
it's overseen by the overseen. It's 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 subject to state law and it's primarily funded um, by grants from the federal government. So it's really complicated to try to point somebody to one particular place where you can say you can put pressure on one place and, and see some kind of result because the funding comes from different places and then all these different law enforcement agencies participate. Um, certainly the San Diego Police Department does um, participate in the Fusion Center and uh, certainly any surveillance technology that the San Diego Police Department uses um, that falls under the oversight ordinance will now need to be reviewed and approved. And if they're sharing data with the, the, the Fusion Center, um, that is a data sharing practice that's going to need to be approved. Uh, you know, that's going to be under oversight and it's going to need to be approved. But that shouldn't give anybody too much confidence because the sheriffs don't fall under that law and immigration enforcement don't fall under our our oversight law the fbi doesn't fall under our oversight law and so uh, if we are interested in raising community power to address those kinds of locations then we're going to need to keep working we're going to need to expand our efforts into the county and into the state levels uh, to further exert influence over those kinds of those kinds of facilities. Um, Khalid, does that match up with what what you what your understanding is of the fusion centers? Yeah, you have. I mean, I would say I, I believe it also has its roots in kind of the post 9-11 world when they were trying to Patriot Act and all of these other types of things were which were a means to get rid of our constitutional rights. So Again, it's one of these things that are built on fear, but then can be used, sometimes an understandable fear, uh, but then can be used in any way, shape, or, or, or form. And so, um, yeah, no, I think it's, yeah, I think you did a good job of kind of explaining what those are, what they look like, and again, why we should be concerned um, about them. Genevieve, I, I know we're at seven and it's time to, to, to thank everybody for coming, but you know, getting involved in the Privacy Advisory Board would be a great way for community members to keep in touch and to engage on this issue and to continue to build power on this issue into these other halls of, of government that we're talking about here. So I just wanted to point that out. Absolutely. And I don't want anyone to take off just yet because I do have an exit poll for you all. And another question just came in. So before I launch those polls, we have a question from a community member who says that my main concern with the surveillance state is the presumption that data is not only neutral, but also sufficient. As we know from body cameras, even in the best of situations, perspective is dependent on the point of view. And this is even more problematic when we are provided only limited and or redacted releases of footage. Yet there's still the presumption of truth around surveilled data that disadvantages individuals and privileges technology over people. Outside of ordinances, how do we fight that? Now, I'm gonna let you all think about that. And I wanna say to this community member, you are so spot on. And I'm reminded of a quote that Mr. Caldwell, who was a part of the city's administration at the time of the launching of the Smart Streetlight said right there in the video, that our data, was not as pure as we wanted it to be. <laughs> it's like when he said that, I'm like, you don't say, but also what do you mean? And how did that impact your decision-making as the city, right? But outside of ordinances, how do we fight that fact that even the data we get can be problematic? Um, I mean, I think just being aware of that is important, right? Um, and again, that these technologies all have people behind them and most of them have agendas behind them. And so you, it's, it's, it's just important that we, I don't think there's any easy solution. I think we always have to educate ourselves about all of these types of things and look at everything with like a critical eye um, and ask ourselves, are the, do the risks of this outweigh the, the benefits? Um, what are the agendas behind this, this, the data? Um, 
is 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 a really important um, first step. And so I would, I mean, research, reading, 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 research, 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 not on YouTube, right? We're not talking about that, like coming to community forums like this, finding people. Again, we now have a board and an ordinance that should be passed any day now that is going to have a ton of information out there. Um, and so hopefully people will just, you know, will actually spend the time and effort to read and understand these issues as much as possible and seek out, you know, experts, you know, like the Trust Coalition, like, you know, uh, and others in order to understand what's really going on. And the, I think the presumption, the assumption should always be made that the biases that we have as human beings, whether it's racism, whether it's uh, chauvinism, whether it's patriarchy, wh whatever biases we have, you should expect that our technologies are gonna mirror those biases, that those technology and build and strengthen them, they rarely break down um, the biases. But that's my, you know, I'm somewhat of a Luddite. Uh, so that's my perspective. And then you could always call Jen. You could always call Genevieve. If, if, if that doesn't work, just call Jen. I was going to break out into a Badu song, but Seth, anything to add? <laughs> you know, one thing that comes to mind is that a lot of the data that you're going to be getting from these systems is going to be coming at you through your chosen news feed. And, uh, you know, it's news is in a tough spot and it's easy to walk away from news right now. It's easy to be critical, but maybe now's the time to really engage with your news sources. And when, when somebody says, hey, the police went to a, to a shooting because of a shot spotter alert, to, to, to ask questions about that assumption. Um, the, the media has been uh, and continues to be very um, permissive to, to, to law enforcement and, and official city narratives uh, and, and doesn't often question uh, the, the full story. Um, when you see a video, a body camera video, you 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 might want to question when did this body camera video start? When did it stop? And where are the parts that I'm not seeing? And why am I not seeing them? So these 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 kinds of things happening in the media, um, I think, is an important opportunity for the average person uh, who is learning about this stuff through their media feeds to to ask people for more to do more, to, to, to educate more. And I think that's fair to ask. And uh, I think we could, we, could, we could encourage more truth to come out that way. Hey, and shout out to people like Jesse Marks at uh, Voice of San Diego, Katie Stiegel, who's on here also, who's you know, done some important work. And those you know, folks out there who are actually covering these issues and, 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 and digging into them. Mm -hmm. um, all of this stuff is more complex than a tweet. And so it's gonna take, it's gonna take time to, to actually research, understand it and figure out those people who, maybe some of our resources, Jen, that are sent out can be people that should be followed um, who do actually kind of take a little bit of a deeper um, look into some of these things. Indeed, and I would be remiss, and I know that Khaled, you talked about Council Member Montgomery Step throughout this conversation, but I would be remiss if I didn't say shout out to her because we couldn't get anything across the finish line without a champion who really believed in what we were saying. And she has been fearless, she has been courageous. And when we talk about the shot spider contract not being renewed, our talking points were simply follow the lead of D4. If you are a council member of a district that does not have shot spotters, you need to follow the lead of the impacted community. Listen to what Council Member Montgomery Stepp says. And she came out full force as she had always said and said, I do not stand by this technology right now in this way. And so I really wanna just say, thank you so much to Council Member Montgomery Stepp. Sabrina has placed into the chat, Mogo social media, Trust SD social media, also a link to our YouTube channel where you can watch previous town halls. It's amazing to me that we've done three of these as part of our summer series town halls and Council Member Montgomery Stepp has championed all three of the things that we're talking about in the town hall. So last month we talked about protect, 
which is the ordinance that seeks to curb racial profiling that we absolutely need. I really want to just really entreat you all to learn more about the PROTECT ordinance, which is preventing over-policing through equitable community treatment. And then of course, the first town hall was around ranked choice voting. So please, you know, take a look at those things. And now I'm gonna ask for you to please participate in the new poll. If I can, let's see, it better not relaunch the same poll. It did people, it did. How did I know that was gonna happen? Give me one second because I really do want to make sure that we have. Why? why? See technology. I'm what call it. I just, you know, just forget it. Here's what we're going to do. I have a question for you all. I want to put this in gallery view because, as I said, we are interactive and I want to make sure that I see all your lovely faces, but I'm gonna ask for you to raise your virtual hand if you believe that technology affects you or your community. So if it's a yes for you, go ahead and raise your virtual hands. I'm seeing hands going up across the screen. All right, all right, all right. So it looks like the majority of us believe and know that technology affects us and our community. Um, Tassine, you must be unavailable because I know you know Yusuf Miller. I know <laughs> you know. So I'm saying we got 100%. So that means that our numbers are up from even the first time that we did this poll at the start of this town hall. So thank you so very much for that. And then the final question is, go ahead and lower those virtual hands and I can actually help you out with that as well. I wanna know how many of us are going to apply to be on the Privacy Advisory Board? So Mark says, where is the hand? Come on, Seth, you're, you're the tech person. I know you can explain it better than me where we can find the hand. You can find it under the reactions button. Perfect. So if you are going to apply for the Privacy Advisory Board, please raise your hand. Oh, I love this. Yusuf is gonna apply. Matt is going to apply. I wanna know if you are thinking about applying. If you have an interest, maybe you just need more information. And trust me, we are here as a resource for you all. But if you're thinking about it, raise your hand. Ellis says he's applying. Thank you. Oh my gosh, thank you. We have the link to apply. And again, if you want to talk with someone about that before you apply, we are here. But I am so happy to see those numbers. Yes, 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 yes. And the last question that I had was, did you learn something new coming to this town hall? So if you already knew about everything, that was covered and spoken about today, don't raise your hand. But if you learn something new from this town hall, go ahead and raise that virtual hand. We want to know. Hands are going up all around, all around. So this is, yes, I'm seeing hand raises and thumbs up. I love this. Thank you all so very much. So, you know, there was obviously a lot of things that we could cover. Um, we did pack a lot in. But thank you all for being here. Thank you, Professor Alexander, for being a part of this panel. I know you have to go. Seth, thank you so very much. I'm going to hand this over to Ms. Brown to wrap up. Thank you so much, Genevieve, Seth, and Khalid for such an important and impactful discussion. And thank you all for attending tonight's town hall. You were such an incredible audience, and we hope that this discussion was informative and helpful. Be sure to be on the lookout for that email that contains MoGo's resource guide on surveillance in San Diego. And if you've missed any of our previous town halls, 
please go back and watch them on MOGO's YouTube so that you can be sure to learn about all of MOGO's current campaigns, our RCV, Ranked Choice Voting, and our Protect campaign. Be sure to follow MOGO and the Trust SD Coalition on all of our social media. We'll be putting those links in the chat for you. And thank you again so, so much for attending our final town hall in our 2022 town hall summer series. Have an incredible night, everyone.